Well, good morning from Southport near Loxton in the Northern Cape where it is surprisingly cold. I mean, don't get me wrong, I know it can get cold up here, but um, I feel like winter's just kind of sneak attacked us. <laughs> it's, it's definitely the coldest night of the year so far that we've experienced being from the coast. And we maybe weren't properly prepared for it. Um, I've only got shorts and, and slip slops for the rest of our trip. Although that's kind of normally what I, <laughs> what I pack anyway. Uh, but we're gonna make some coffee to get ourselves warmed up. Uh, sun is just about to rise, so we might just put up a bit of a time lapse there. And yeah, uh, start making some breakfast before hitting the road. We've got about probably a six hour drive today, I would think, if we include a bit of a stop. So we don't want to dilly dally too long. And um, we probably want to hit the road by around about 8 o'clock or 8.30 at the very latest. So we can actually enjoy our time at Gifberg in the Cedarburg, which is where we're going this evening. So stick with us. It's going to be a good one. Remember in the previous episode when I said that I'd made it my goal to be less time conscious and to try and enjoy the moment? Well, Nicole encourages me to just sit and soak in some sun a little bit as it starts to hit our campsite. So we pack up a little bit slower than originally planned and get a little bit of vitamin D before hitting the road. Today's drive will take us in a westerly direction on a 454km journey across the Upper Karoo, starting with a long but easy drive on a tar road before descending the Van Rijns Pass into the Western Cape, turning south and driving deep into the mountains at Gifberg as we navigate some very rough 4x4 roads down into the Dooring River Valley. At Carnarvon we turn left, putting us on the Karoo Highlands route a quiet, straight road that we'd be cruising along for the next few hours. The reason this is called the Karoo Highlands route is because of its elevation. There are parts of the Karoo that are only a few hundred meters above sea level, but this far north, we're sitting above a kilometer for almost the entire route. The tiny town of Williston provides the only signs of civilization that we'd be seeing the whole morning and I hear you can buy some killer toasted sandwiches here, but we're continuing on towards Calvinia. As we get a little bit closer to Calvinia, we start to see more and more mountains and kopjes and we'd actually be passing back through this way in a few days time en route to Sutherland so these views will be enjoyed more than once on this trip. This is of course the same route that we took on our previous west coast adventure but last time we drove through the section between Calvinia and Neuvotville it looked very very different. If you're going to visit this part of the country, the uh, Namaqualan slash west coast the best times of the year are definitely around April and around sort of September because 
you're not going to get that scorching heat of, of the middle of summer and you're not going to get the cold, cold nights of the, of the middle of winter. Um, and also the wind in April is, is really nice. It's one of the reasons we've chosen this time to go. Uh, however, I will say the one thing that's missing is the color of the flowers. Last time we drove here, this place was just absolutely uh, blossoming with uh, so many flowers everywhere. You just saw colors as far as I could see. But now it's just dead and without color. So yeah, those are the two best times to go. Flower season is definitely something special. Definitely go for it. The descent down from the Rains Pass takes a little longer than expected, with roadworks causing some pretty intense traffic jams, but the views over the Western Cape Lowlands are still just as good as always. Well, we've just pulled in at the petrol station and I've noticed it's been over a thousand kilometers since I last full, which is actually crazy if you consider the, the drag on this vehicle and the extra weight and the, you know, the all-terrain tires we have. As a comparison, the, the Tacoma, which is kind of the similar choice in the US, very, very similar size to the Hilux with its petrol engine, factory, like stock vehicle, you're looking at like 20 to 23 miles per gallon. Whereas the Hilux, even with all this extra drag and weight, I'm sitting at 20 miles per gallon at the moment which is great. So yeah, diesel is definitely the way to go if you want to do uh, trips like this. But I must say that the extra 80 liters of fuel capacity with an auxiliary tank definitely helps. There's not a lot of fuel stops on these roads and I tend to prefer to kind of wait until I get to a petrol station that's in a bit more populated area so that we don't get bad, bad fuel. But 1000 Ks with this vehicle is no joke. Oh yes, we are finally on the gravel. Say goodbye to the tar road. <laughs> Feels good. Uh, we've still got, sheesh, probably half an hour to 45 minutes, maybe even a bit more to go to get to our campsite. But we can see the mountains ahead of us that we need to climb over to get to our spot. Uh, we're going to ascend the Hufberg Pass. And then I assume we've got to check in to, uh, to get to our little bush camp on the, on the river. So, uh, foot to the floor. Gonna cook some food, get something to drink, let Huxley get out and stretch his legs, and uh, then we'll head on to our camp. We've been waiting for a good spot to make lunch, but not knowing what the road looks like the rest of the way up, and with the tummies grumbling, we decide to take the first opportunity we get to pull over. Well, we've decided to make a quick late lunch stop on the side of the Gifberg Pass. We've got a lovely view here of the of the mountains and we, we're starting to get that sort of Cedarburg look with the really um, bizarre rock formations. Uh, we've got some crumb chicken that we've just um, taken out the fridge and we've got some tortilla wraps, some cheese, some tomatoes, some mayonnaise. So we're going to just make a few chicken wraps for a quick easy lunch. And then we'll close up the awning, get back on the road, and it's probably another half an hour to camp from here. So, making good time today. This is the first time that we're using the front runner tailgate table to cook a roadside lunch. And I must say, we're enjoying the extra space that the pull-out cutting board provides. It makes all the difference when you've got a bunch of different ingredients that you need to access regularly. While Nicole's cooking, we're going to let the tires down a little bit, because we've got gravel roads and mountain passes the rest of today and tomorrow morning and all the way on the west coast tomorrow when we get to the sand so I'm just gonna let it down to two bar at the back and probably 1.8 in the front that should that should be good for gravel road driving at relatively high perfect Quick trick with your inflate if you have an inflate, just lubricate these O-rings here because after a while they get really stiff. Um, I just added a bit of grease before this trip and it just makes it so much easier to open and close. Perfect. 
As you can probably guess at this point, we're severely underestimating how long the last leg of our journey will take. What Google Maps says will take half an hour is about to take close to four hours. Cheers. That being said, the lunch stop was definitely mm. worth the time lost. That just makes this memory all the sweeter. Mm. Can you? Can you give me your paw? Good boy. Can you boop? Good boy. I'm gonna wait. 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 Eat it. <laughs> Look here. Eat that. The Cedarberg is known for its twisted rock formations, but as we reach the top of the pass and start to navigate the mountain roads, it's clear that there's a lot more to this particular area than just a bunch of rocks. As it turns out, the white sand up here seems to create the perfect environment for growing rooibos tea, and we pass countless rows of rooibos bushes as we move deeper into the mountains. Soon though, we leave all signs of farming behind us as we turn onto a road that says 4x4 and things start to look a little rougher. Remember those thunderstorms that we'd seen in episode 1 in the Karoo? Well, it turns out that the rain had caused flood damage all over the country and we'd be experiencing the aftermath of this flooding for the rest of our trip. On this road, what it had done was to wash all the soft white sand away in certain areas not that big of a deal when it's just sand, but as you'll see in a moment, it made things pretty interesting in the rocky areas. The drive was beautiful, and up ahead we could see some of the familiar peaks of the Cedarberg to the south. We seemed to be making good time, but when we came over a ridge and caught our first glimpse of the Duering River below, the river that we'd be camping at, we realized that we still had a long way to go, and it was going to get steep. If you look at a 3D map on Gaia GPS, you can see the Duerung River Valley with a 4x4 pass zigzagging down to the bottom. It looks small in the context of the whole day's route, but this was not going to be a walk in the park. Okay, this is what we've been waiting for. We've had too much tar road driving over the last few days, but Nicole's about to experience some proper 4x4 in here. I'm gonna try to guide her down. Look at this. Got some really nice rock steps here. So I think we're gonna get her to stick here on the right hand side. I think she'll be alright.
This sort of rocky terrain is nothing new for us. In fact, this is pretty similar to the roads in the Bovianskloof and Koga Mountains right on our doorstep. But our relaxed behavior was about to change pretty quickly around the next corner. In our experience, these BF Goodrich tires can handle quite a lot of abuse. It's the reason we bought them in the first place and punctures through the tread are pretty rare on rounded rocks like these. But sometimes you just get unlucky and as we were slowly crawling down this road, we heard a sound that nobody wants to hear in a remote place like this. Oh man, uh, just heard a loud escape of air and this one is not going to be able to be plugged. That's a huge, huge tear. Really bad tear. Um, we just see the rock there that caused it. It's quite a sharp rock right on the edge. We must have just nicked it. But, yep, we're going to have to take the spare off and replace it. Thankfully our spare's not underneath. Make it a bit easier to get off, but... That's a big bummer, and also it probably means we're going to have to go find a, a new tire somewhere tomorrow before we before we uh, carry on. So not good news, but let's make the most of it. Let's change it as quickly as we can. We're going to run out of light soon. All action from here. The road wasn't perfectly level, but thankfully it was good enough that we could find a decent spot to jack. It's never ideal to have an unexpected delay like this, but I'm quite proud of the way we worked as a team. This wheel change didn't take very long at all. Even Huxley tried to make himself look busy, although it didn't help our cause very much. Okay, well, quick reality check. Uh, that tire, because it's not repairable, it, it means that we do not have any spares now. There is no signal here, so... If we do get another bad puncture that we can't plug, we are stuck here. Um, I do have a, um, a satellite phone, so if I have to, I can SMS the people here to come fetch us, but we really don't want to have to revert to that. So we are going to be very, very, very careful on the way down the rest of the way. We probably are guilty of rushing a bit on the way down, just wanting to get to camp um, and not just not respecting the road enough. but. Uh, we won't make the mistake again. We're going to be very, very cautious and careful. If I have to hop out regularly to spot for Nicole or vice versa, we're going to do that. But let's get safely to camp. And then tomorrow we have to yeah, get back out on the same route and find another spare. Because there's no ways we are camping on the west coast without, without a spare. Uh, so, yep, things have changed. But once again, just the, the shakedown trip has really been testing us. Um, and uh, we did not expect it to be this challenging with all the problems we've had. But that's what we do these things for, I guess. So let's solve these problems. The purpose of a shakedown trip is to find the strengths and weaknesses of your setup. Sometimes you have to push things to the limit in order to find the limit. We had our questions about how this vehicle would handle challenging 4x4 tracks with a fully loaded camper on the back, and this drive gave us information that we needed. We learned from this that while the camper itself held up perfectly, we probably needed to upgrade our brakes at some point and could also benefit from a stronger leaf pack at the back or airbags to keep stability when carrying this extra load. We do have an upgraded constant load leaf pack already but it's maybe just a bit light for this setup. 17 inch rims to replace the 18s are also on our shopping list.
this section parallel to the river was nice and smooth but the moment we approached the final right turn taking us down towards the river it got a bit hairy again and we had to take it very slow as the gradient increased and the rocks got bigger. Because I can't tell you how just stressful this is having this look at this in front of us knowing that we can jump in there and swim and have a beer and make a fire but knowing that we have to get down this to get there that's not a road <laughs> that's not a road and we don't have a spare but i think we can probably lay some rocks and make it work To say that the drive was worth it would be the understatement of the year. This spot was not only my favourite of the whole trip, but probably one of the most insanely gorgeous, remote, wild camping spots I had ever stayed at. We wasted no time at all jumping in the water to cool off after a particularly stressful afternoon. Camp setup can wait when you have scenery like this around you. I'm coming, my boy, I'm coming. <laughs> the hardest thing to accept is that we only have one evening here, so we really want to make the moment count and won't be rushing to get to bed tonight. Well, as you know, we've been having problems with our dual battery system. Uh, we can drive the whole day, but it never charges at the right amount of amps. So when we get to camp, a few hours later, the battery dies just from the, from the consumption of the fridge. Um, we're still not 100% sure what the, the issue is. We think it's just wiring. But in the meantime, we have a, a temporary solution. Uh, I brought this Goal Zero with me, which is just a lead acid battery. I think it's like a 30 amp hour or something battery. And this can provi provide some extra power and it can be charged from the cigarette lighter in the car while we drive. So we've been charging it in the front, it's fully charged. And we went to Outdoor Warehouse and bought one of these cables for the, for the fridge. So essentially what we're gonna do is we've gotta unplug the cable that's going from that battery there. We're gonna plug in this one and then we're gonna turn on the goal zero and we're gonna plug this in there you go switching back on in the morning when we drive this will be charging and that battery will be charging hopefully when we get to the west coast both of them will be close to fully charged so yeah that should be pretty good but uh, it's always good to have a backup because when these things fail you have to make a plan, as we've learned multiple times on this trip. Oh, we thought today was going to be one of the easier days, but we were so wrong. I think we just underestimated the condition of the road uh, coming up to this campsite or down to this campsite and it ended up being just a lot more of a challenge than we initially expected um, we probably arrived here half an hour before the sun set after leaving at like 8 30 9 o'clock this morning so it was a very long day but tonight uh, we're not gonna let things get to us we're gonna stay up enjoy it it feels like we're on the beach almost with this with this uh, white sand. So very cool spot, and uh, we're gonna make the most of it. How would you sum up today hmm. in a few words? <laughs> Character building. Yeah. yeah okay. I, can't, I don't know if I can beat that to be honest. Yeah. Cool. There, there was something about just you know there were points where I thought you know maybe the wise thing to do would be to turn around and find you know to not risk it. 
but then you just see the the river down there and you're like exactly oh, you're like so we're so close. close i know yeah just off these next few boulders but yeah i think if we didn't have the satellite phone i might have just said i don't know let's call it these things happen but i think i think what i think what we're going to do in the future is carry that fifth spare and then a sixth mm. spare underneath yeah for anything like this where it's relatively remote mm. there's very little signal and it's rough riding yeah i think we'll look back and laugh but in the moment it's not funny in the moment mm -mm. you just i think i wanted to cry a few times yeah <laughs> i'm glad you kept me kept me um sane for a little bit of them yeah well the, the whole point of this trip is to learn what to do Oof. better next time yeah and I mean, it's an experience. It's this is what football four is about. This is what overlanding is yeah. about. Like we, 100%. that's why we get a spare tire. You know, we don't get yeah. a spare tire just to have an extra place to hang our bags on. Yeah, it's that's in case true. this happens. So, that's true. and I mean, it was good to do something different today. Hey, look at the pr look at the plus. Look at the time it took for us to change the tire mm. in Botswana. Getting mm -hmm. it that stupid tool, getting yeah, it out the bottom. Out, yo, that was rough. Versus getting it off the back. So much quicker. And it just shows like yeah. that this setup and what we had in mind. It, it actually works. works great, yeah. Um, so it's achieved what we wanted to achieve. Yeah. Well I think all that's left to do this evening is to put a wonderful Wagyu T bone steak on the fire. Mm. You're gonna make some potato salad. I am indeed. We'll probably just sit here by the fire a little bit longer and soak it in. Mm -hmm. And then we have to get up early tomorrow and do it all <laughs> over again to get out. I think maybe we'll call this episode Roll with the Punches or something like that. But yeah, yeah. it's been good. I've been saving this piece of meat for a really long time. Um, somebody gave this to me. It's uh, from Meat on Stanley and it's a T-bone Wagyu steak. And I've had from the same supplier uh, sirloin and it was the best meat I've ever tasted so I've been saving it for this trip so that we can pair it with this beautiful campsite and what we're going to do is we're going to make a bit of a rub to put on it and then we're going to bry it uh, what I did last time tasted really good essentially we're going to take some uh, kickerman soy sauce and just put a little bit of that in there we're going to take some Bry salt from Diversity Blends. This is like, it's my favorite bry salt. We actually had it on the pork rashes that we had last night. Um, it's really, really good. And we're gonna just put a generous amount of this in here. And then we're also going to take a little bit of olive oil, mix all of this together, rub it on our steak. That soya just kind of to me, it just gives that Japanese, like teppanyaki sort of taste. It's kind of hard to mess it up because there's so much marbling and fat in here that it doesn't dry out. So that's a good thing, but this should be good. Looking forward to it. Okay, while Nicole cooks her potato salad, let's see what we can do with the steak. Oh, this is gonna be so good. Oh, well, there you go, all done. The best steak you'll ever have. Well, you won't have it, but Nicole will. <laughs> Needless to say, we ended the day off on a high note. And do we manage to get out? Well, that's tomorrow's story. In episode 3, we tackled the climb out of the Dwaring River Valley, a task that turns out to be even more challenging than the journey in. And after finding a replacement tyre in a nearby town, we make our way towards the wonderful west coast, where all of our worries seem to drift away as we travel along hundreds of kilometres of remote sandy roads. <laughs>